Akka, we are good to go. Um, Mom, you're mute. Apologies. Can you all hear me now? Yes. All yes. right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I start again at the beginning. My right. my heartfelt thanks to the organizers of uh, Tatwa Loka, in particular, Mrs. Sharala Panchapakeshan and Mrs. Vasumati, and to my two good uh, friends who have been doing all the technical assistance, uh, Shreya Nagarajan Singh and Ramakshir Sagar. Thank you all so much. So yesterday, last week, we had part one of this series. And uh, today we are having the second part. I'll do a very brief recap just for a few minutes for those of you who hadn't attended uh, the last session. We, a very brief one. So we had spoken about the sources of history and uh, we spoke about coins. And what I'm showing you are uh, uh, some coins of the Chola period. We also spoke about inscriptions as a very important, very important source of history. And here is a copper plate inscription from the Vijayanagara times. We, we learned about stone inscriptions, the scripts, the languages, and also the copper plate inscriptions. Uh, we also saw some of the beautiful sandstone pillars of Ashoka, the Mauryan king, which belonged to the 3rd century BCE. We also spoke about temple tanks, such as this one in Manargudi, the temple town of uh, Manargudi, uh, which is the largest temple tank in the whole world. Uh, we saw tanks like this, the step tank in Hampi, and the aqua ducts of Hampi that carried water to the city. This is a place called Abhaneri in Rajasthan, close to Jaipur, where there is a very, very deep and exquisitely crafted step well, uh, Modera, the sun temple in Modera, Gujarat, that also has a lovely step tank like this. And we went to Rani Ki Vav, also in Gujarat, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the best known step tank in the whole of India, where at ground level you don't see anything. And as you slowly proceed, you keep going down, down, down. That's how it is, meters below the ground. And uh, now we are going to come to what are called Stala Vrikshams. Many of you who have gone to uh, the temples of South India, especially the temples of Tamil Nadu, would have seen a tree somewhere inside the compound. And uh, we won't even give it a second glance. We think it's for some religious purpose and it doesn't concern us at all and we keep walking. Sometimes you may have a plaque or a board over there that says, it's the Stalavriksham of this temple and uh, some story uh, connecting that particular tree. Vriksham is tree in Sanskritam. Stalam is place. So the sacred tree of that place in Sanskritam is called Stalavriksham. There may be some kind of a board that gives you an explanation of how that tree is connected with the, the Stala Puranam or the traditional story of that particular temple. But more often than not, we hardly, hardly pay attention to that tree, but that's a mistake. We need to. For example, this is a uh, mango tree. And we've seen mangoes and mangoes in India, so we are really not very bothered when we see a mango tree inside or immediately outside a temple. But you see, the mango tree, other than the delicious fruit that we eat all the time, the mango tree has very many medicinal properties. And before I go into some of the trees in particular, I want to tell all of you, and uh, again, I want to say, like I said last time, that these lectures have been structured for young uh, students. Uh, it's very nice that many others have also joined, parents, teachers, friends, etc. But I'm, I, am, I am now speaking to a young audience, students. So, you know, in ancient times and in medieval times, and even now we know, but we are not doing anything about it. We understand that many, many trees have medicinal value. 
and these trees have been for centuries and centuries used by traditional practitioners of medicine like ayurveda for making their medicines even now doctors following the traditional practice of medicine um make make lots of lots of their medicines from the trees the bark the roots the fruits the seeds leaves etc so these trees have huge medicinal properties other than various other benefits like letting out oxygen etc and therefore our ancients decided that the forests of these trees would be labeled sacred groves and that at least one particular specimen of that tree would be inside the temple premises as a sacred tree stala vriksham so that it would be very very safe if it's inside the temple complex it's very safe and many a shrine many a temple had been built in the middle of a sacred grove so uh, take for example a very famous temple the one of meenakshi sundareshwarar in the ancient and the hori city of madurai there is a song by muthu swami dikshit who said kadamba vana nilaye so kadamba kadamba vana she was in the forest of uh, kadamba trees uh, now we go to the mango here ma in tamil and in sanskritam it's amra may i have taken all this information from a wonderful book published by the cp ramaswamy iyer foundation i must acknowledge it so many many parts of trees of this mango tree have been used in traditional medicine you can all read it over here dried powder of the tender leaves are given for diarrhea and sugar complaints a decoction of the leaves and bark causes shrinking of tissues and arrests bleeding in north india a beverage is made from roasted unripe fruits and used as a cure for sunstroke and the mango tree is a stala vrikshan in many shiva and vishnu temples also associated with buddhists and jains and used in many many religious functions so that's with the mango tree and that is the sacred tree of the ekamranatha temple in kanchipuram very very famous mango tree is there now we go to a place called tiruvalangad for those who those of you who know tamil it you can easily understand the meaning of this name but for those who don't let me explain tiru in tamil is sacred alam alam is the uh, banyan tree kadu is a forest tiru alam kadu together becomes tiruvalangadu and this is a place which is um, about 2 hours my drive. voice is breaking a lot oh my voice is breaking no ma Uh, no, no, it's quite not good. I know I'm getting sunburned. Not really. It's your your you're fine. I'm fine. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you are fine. Quite clear. Thank you. It's so okay. Much. It's okay. No problem. Thank you so much. So we go. The Sirvalangad is a very ancient uh, place, which is about two hours drive from Chennai, approximately near Arakonam. And Sirvalangad has a temple for Shiva. And the Shiva there, interestingly, is called. Vataranyeshwara. Vata in Sanskritam is Banyan. Aranya is forest. Ishwara is God. So Vataranyeshwara is the God Shiva of the Vata Aranya of the forest of Banyan trees. Same thing as Tiruvalangad in Tamil. Vataranya in Sanskritam. And <clears throat> Vataranyeshwara is the name of that God. Now what is very very interesting about this temple is that Uh, i am i know digressing a little from stala vriksham but uh, it is very appropriate that i say this here the shiva in this temple uh, resides in in tiruvalangad resides in one of the panchas stalam that is the one of the five places where shiva is known to dance and the number one among these five places is the kanaka sabha or the chitambalam in chidambaram there shiva is nataraja it's a nataraja temple we know of that well the second place where nataraja dances is the rajata sabha which is the meenakshi sundareshwara temple in madurai which is also called the velli ambalam velli in tamil is silver and rajata is in sanskritam silver then we go to tiruvalangad over here which is called the ratna sabha or the hall of gems here also 
it's a home of nataraja then we go to the tamra sabha the hall of copper in tirunelveli which is the nelliyappar kanthimathi temple famous one finally we have the chitra sabha um, this is the hall of paintings again a very important place for nataraja that is in kutralam so tiru alam kaadu this was once a dense forest of banyan trees the banyan tree is still the stalavriksham of this temple but very little i'm afraid of this forest this vataranyam or this alankadu is left in this town and this is true of almost all the places which are known to be where, where temples are known to be in sacred groves almost all of it has unfortunately gone our ancients for a purpose demarcated that area as sacred they gave it the tag not only because it was really sacred there was a religious association but also because these trees whether it is amra or whether it is vata whichever tree they have a lot of medicinal properties need to be safeguarded for the sake of making medicines among among various other uh, uses and purposes so here is the sad state of the vata aranya in tiruvalangad we have very little left i'm afraid this is what it looks and um, we now go to the kapaleshwarar temple in the heart of chennai i understand that many of you uh, in this audience are from chennai so something from here um other than the main sanctum of kapaleshwarar and his consort parvati called karpagambal in this temple there is a small shrine as you come in a clockwise direction in pradakshina of this temple and there you will see a board called punnai vana nathar then the inside the small shrine there is a shivalinga this is it the small shrine punnai is this tree over here it's the punnai mara uh, i'll go back to the previous slide punnai is the tree vana is forest nathar is natha is god so punnai vana nathar is here now why is he called punnai vana nathar vanam is forest so punnai vanam there was a huge forest of punnai trees obviously somewhere in this area at one point of time and this is god shiva of the punnai vanam and therefore he is called punnai vana nathar that punnai vanam is no way to be seen we won't even know about it but for the name over here which is a dead giveaway saying that there was a punnai forest over here but the stalavriksham of this temple this kapaleshwara temple in mailapur in chennai is the punnai maram and there it is over here and this sanctum is immediately underneath that tree now uh, some of my friends who work in an ngo called niral that does very good work for for saving trees and protecting trees in chennai told me this and i need to acknowledge where i got this information from so my friends in niral told me that this punnai tree is has the capacity of growing very near the sea shore you see there are many trees and plants that will not survive when there is salt breeze and near the sea shore you have nothing but salt air so they the our ancients were wise enough to understand that they had to have a stalavriksham which was very important for medicinal purposes and as a tree that would withstand the salt laden wind breeze and obviously this kind of tree grew in abundance over there we must also understand that the present kapaleshwara temple in mailapur in chennai is not in its original original location the original site of this temple was somewhere near the sea shore and at a later point of time for various reasons it was relocated to where it is today and therefore in that original place near the sea shore there must have been a forest of punnai trees and a particular tree was selected as the stalavriksham of the tree uh, of that temple and when it was relocated to its present premises also maybe there was a vanam a forest of punnai trees and now inside this temple there is this one solitary punnai tree punnai vana punnai maram punnai tree the punnai vanam the forest is sadly sadly not to be seen so this is the punnai tree and uh, this has been associated with again i have taken it from this book uh, uh, sacred trees published by the sipiram samayar foundation 
it is the this flower of this punai tree is one of the eight flowers offered to this deity shiva during early morning worship that's the religious aspect medicinal uses just see how many there are the leaf extract is used to soothe and sore eyes and as a snuff to relieve giddiness and headache the juice of the bark is given internally to stop profuse internal and external bleeding the punai flowers are used to treat nervous disorders paralysis and to reduce body temperature the oil extracted from the seed kernel is used to relieve pain and leprosy and as a remedy for pain in the joints and muscles ulcers and skin diseases so you see how much how much one tree can give us we've seen the mango we've seen the punai tree um, this is the ekamaranatha temple in kanchipuram very very famous temple where the amra the mango tree is the sacred tree it is very clearly associated uh, with god shiva and goddess parvati in this temple i won't go into the details the religious aspect plus the medicinal aspect made the sacred groves and they make the sacred tree that important we have forgotten that purpose all together and we are the poorer for it for destroying all these forests that had these medicinal uh, trees okay so that is to do with the stalavrikshams we now go to another topic altogether and we are now going to talk about education many of you who are looking at the screen will clearly understand that this is nalanda the ruins of the great great center of learning in present day bihar in india so nalanda university was started approximately approximately in the 5th century bc B, uh, ad sorry second uh, 5th century ad during the period of the gupta kings the famous gupta kings of north india and it was basically a buddhist monastery but many many other subjects were taught over here huge number of subjects were taught over here and you would have all studied in your textbooks that people from all over india and from various other parts of the world from china from various other countries sri lanka etc throng to this university to study there were very strict rules of admission very very strict rules they had to pass a tough exam to get into this university because the standard of education was so so high there were three libraries we get to know a lot of information from uh, buddhist manuscripts and other uh, other sources about this nalanda university three libraries huge libraries were there they were called ratna sagar ratnodadi and ratna ranjak look at the beautiful names ratna is gem ratna sagar means an ocean of gems sea of gems ratna odadi means an ocean of gems ratna ranjak means a collection of gems what are these gems these gems were the manuscripts that were stored in them ayurvedic manuscripts buddhist manuscripts hindu manuscripts so many precious precious manuscripts were stored in three huge libraries on the campus so many teachers so many students we could go on and on about nalanda nalanda we also understand that a famous famous chinese buddhist uh, pilgrim of the 7th century uh, can i request all of you to mute yourselves please there's a lot of disturbance uh so huin sang came all the way to china to study in this university he collected a whole lot of uh, manuscripts Uh, to enhance his learning and to take back to china but not many people will tell you okay this is uh, vikramishila not many people will tell you that this huin sang who is very famous great scholar did a lot for for with this learning he we know he came in the reign of king harshavardhana very famous uh, king of north india uh, we know that he he studied in the nalanda university but hardly any history textbook either at the school level or the college level will tell you that this huin sang came all the way to south india he stayed in south india for many years especially in a place called kanchipuram the kanchipuram that is 75 kilometers from chennai and which is very well known today as a town of temples and as a center of silk weaving why did why did huin sang come all the way to kanchipuram and the reason is because this kanchi of ancient times was a very very great center of learning 
you didn't have one particular campus like nalanda university or like vikramashila or takshashila all the great universities we learn about in north india maybe it wasn't like that there wasn't one structure inside one campus but it was a very very great center of buddhist learning vedic learning and jain learning we had all of this in kanchipuram we have enough and more reference for that and this huin sang who is so famous came all the way to kanchipuram he stayed here for several years to learn buddhism all right so so this is a little known fact and i'd like all of you to know about it now what the the temple that you are seeing in this photograph is a pallava era 8th century temple called the kailasanatha temple today it's called the kailasanatha temple the ancient name was rajasimheshwara since it was constructed in the reign of king rajasimha uh, and com- almost almost completely built of sandstone now this uh, temple has a small mantapa inside we'll come to that later now um i am not digressing from the main topic of kanchipuram being a center of learning i am getting there but bear with me and watch this map look at this map there was a dynasty called the kadamba dynasty not many people know about it kadamba dynasty had its capital in a place called uh, bijayanti and this is the approximate approximate area of the kadamba dynasty uh, it's like this karnataka area and um, what is very very important is i'm just skipping a few things in shimoga district there is a small temple called the pranaveshwara temple in front of that temple you have a pillar like this which has a very very important inscription it's in sanskrit this inscription and it tells us some extremely interesting and extremely important uh, information about the person who started this dynasty his name was mayura sharma he was a brahmin and uh, he this inscription tells us this mayura sharma along with his guru his teacher veera sharma came all the way to kanchipuram he was not a king at that time mayura sharma was not he was a student of vedic learning and he comes all the way from that area in karnataka to kanchipuram to study in an institution called the ghatika the ghatika was a center of higher learning in vedic studies so mayura sharma and teacher veera sharma come all the way to kanchipuram to study in this ghatika unfortunately what happens is there is a kind of a skirmish some kind of misunderstanding between some pallava soldiers possibly and mayura sharma <clears throat> and he goes back all the way and with a vow with an oath to start a kingdom of his own and to fight against the pallavas but all that we need not go into just to say because of this inscription we understand that mayura sharma from far away karnataka came all the way to 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 the tamil country to kanchipuram to study in an institution called the gatika and uh, this kailasana that was around the 4th century ad that was around the 4th century ad much much later in the 8th century ad oh just give me a second please much later in the 8th century ah oh, sorry just give me a st- second mm. in the 8th century ad this kailasanatha temple about which i told you came to be built the gatika continued to function in kanchipuram but a very very great historian named dr c meenakshi has suggested that after this temple this pallava kailasanatha temple was constructed in the 8th century it is likely that the um, place where the gatika functioned was inside the premises of the kailasanatha temple anyway kanchipuram is also known to be a buddhist center because you know huin sang tells us that and it was um, also a very great jaina center of learning we know that because there is an inscription and other sources as well now where are we going we are going from kanchipuram to a place called ennayiram which is near bijupuram 
and this was the state of that temple and uh, it's now like this it is under the control of the archaeological survey of india maintained beautifully today the reason i'm showing you this temple is because and i'm not going to give you a whole lot of details and bore you but just to tell you that in the chola times of the 11th century ad in the time of rajendra chola this temple which was for narsimha was a very very great center of learning that inscription that is on the wall of this uh, temple tells you the number of students who studied here the number of teachers who were here how many students for each subject the vedas and uh, other other allied uh, scriptures that were taught here how many students for each subject how many teachers for each subject the salary that was paid to the teacher the kind of fellowship stipend that the students had so many details so many details are given so we understand that these temples were not just places of worship they also were centers of learning and now we are going to a place called tribhuvanai this is the varadaraja perumal temple still functioning and uh, this also is a chola era temple uh, there is an inscription here of rajadi raja chola the son and successor of rajendra chola and again it talks about this temple being a center of vedic learning same details students teachers etc 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 all kinds of details are given then so many inscriptions on the walls of this temple this is near pondicherry all right now we come to a very important place called tirumukkudal in tamil the word tirumukkudal means tiru sacred mu three kudal is like a place of joining like sangama so this is a place with three rivers joined the palar and her tributaries the cheyar and the vegavathi must have been a very very scenic place where it is the sangamam of three rivers once upon a time rivers that had water there there is no water there now and very close to this place where the three rivers joined uh, the pallavas built a temple and now this temple is called the appan venkatesha perumal temple and this place the this gramam this village is called tirumukkudal fine now why are we talking about it in the context of education because though the pallavas built this temple when the cholas later came to power in this area oh and i forgot to tell you this temple is on route from chengalpet to kanchipuram in case you want to go in tamil nadu um this temple is also under the control of the archaeological survey of india very beautifully maintained still in active worship so the inscription here tells you again of the 11th century uh, the inscription belongs to the time of the third son veera rajendra of uh, rajendra chola the third son of rajendra chola it's one of the longest to tamil inscriptions ever mentions once again a college being run on the premises again number of teachers number of students what is even more interesting is that it says there was a hostel attached to this college where the students could stay and the facilities that were given to the students in this hostel and what if uh, the teachers or the students that lived here fell ill so there was a hospital what was the name of the hospital veer children and did the hospital have many doctors two are mentioned one a physician and one a surgeon the name of one was ashwatthaman butter what two hospitals need medicine so what kind of medicine was stored here ayurvedic medicine and the names of so many 30 plus ayurvedic medicines are mentioned in this inscription and these medicines are used by practitioners of ayurveda even today clearly the names are given in the inscription in the tamil script of the chola times and uh, what if the person had an injury in the head so there was a babu and there were two assistants who would be sent out to collect herbs for making medicine and uh, to bring them to this hospital all these i'm just giving it to you in a nutshell much 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 more is given in this inscription so we understand that many of these temples were also centers of education they had hospitals they had hostels etc etc we go to the famous ranganatha swami temple on the island of uh, sri rangam uh, this is the main gopuram 
leading into the temple today. Just give me a second. Why I'm showing you this is because uh, there is an inscription in this temple that mentions that there was a library inside. Now, why would you have a library? Because it was also a center of learning. Otherwise, no, no, no need for a library. Here also, there was a Vedic college. All ancillary scriptures must have also been uh, taught over here by teachers. And the library was here. And the library, it says, the inscription says, interestingly, had uh, images and worship of Goddess Saraswati, clearly understandable, uh, God Hayagriva, the Vaishnavite God of learning, wisdom, and Veda Vyasa. So all these deities were worshipped in the library, quite rightly so. Uh, so that's to do with education. Let's learn a little bit about um, Buddhist structures. So here we are going to a place called Sanchi, in Madhya Pradesh, where it's a it was a place that was very, very important to the Buddhists. And today we have numerous monuments in Sanchi, some of which are called the stupas. A stupa, as many of you may know, is a, is a Buddhist monument. This is a small stupa in Sanchi. Approximate, uh, there is a hemispherical uh, shape. And inside which would be kept very safely, the mortal remains, a bone or a, a tooth or some other relic of either the Buddha or some of the great acharyas, teachers of Buddhism. So uh, this is the this is stupa number two in uh, Sanchi, and the compound wall is called a Vedika. Very beautiful compound wall, full of uh, sculptures. So this is stupa two, and these are the sculptures that you have on the Vedika. Now here is something very very interesting, and I would like to acknowledge that I have scanned this photograph from a book called Art of Ancient India by Susan Huntington. Now, the pillars of this Vedika, as I told you, have many sculptures. One sculpture, just look at this, is a pillar. Those of you who attended the previous lecture will understand what I'm saying. The pillar, I'll try to zoom. The pillar is an Ashokan pillar, which has the four lion capital and a chakra above it. So we understand that this tall pillar with the four lion capital and the chakra above it is from Sanchi, the place where the Buddha gave his first lecture. The deer park in Sanchi is very famous, very, very important, very sacred to the Buddhists. So that pillar was kept in Sanchi, um, sorry, I'm sorry, Sarnath, in Sarnath, by Ashoka and Sarnath, not Sanchi, sorry, and Sarnath by Ashoka. And here is the top, which unfortunately was damaged when the pillar broke and the capital fell down. All right. So this is the Maha Stupa in uh, Sanchi, which has a huge, huge Stupa, originally constructed in the time of King Ashoka, the Mauryan king in the 3rd century BC, and later it was damaged and the Shunga kings who subsequently came uh, contributed to this. Now you have the triple umbrella right on top. It's a famous symbol of Buddhism and some scholars have interpreted it to be the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma and the Buddha Sangha. We often say Buddham Sharanam Gachami, Dharmam Sharanam Gachami, Sangam Sharanam Gachami. The three very important components, principles the core of Buddhism. So it is possible that the triple umbrella represents all of these. So what is really, really important about this Mahastupa and Sanchi, other than the sheer size and it's so magnificent is that there are two Vedikas, one at the ground level and one uh, slightly above. This is how it looks, two Pradakshinas. You can do a Pradakshina at the ground level, you can do a Pradakshina there also, circumambulation, and the four Toranas. Uh, like we have Gopurams as the entrance gateways to many of the temples in South India, especially Tamil Nadu, here as gateways. See, when we think of Thorana, we generally think of something festive in flowers or in mango leaves, etc. Thorana in Sanskritam just means decoration. So these are decorative gateways in the four cardinal directions of this stupa. Extremely, extremely well-carved pillars. 
this is how it looks. Unfortunately, some are broken. Um, let me try to zoom. So you here, you have the minutest carvings showing you some Buddhist stupas, stories from what we call the Jataka tales, which chronicle the previous uh, lives, the previous janmas of the Buddha. Now just look at this, look at the carvings over here. Now among the four toranas, an inscription tells you that the southernmost torana was made by, and listen to this, it's so interesting, it was made by ivory carvers. That is, people who were used to carving on ivory were commissioned to carve on these toranas. Because you see, ivory carvers um, have to work very, very carefully. Uh, their work is extremely intricate. You would have seen carving on ivory in museums, etc. So that kind of intricacy and that attention to detail was brought into the sculptures of this torana. And here is a stupa, here is a stupa, here is a stupa, here is the Buddha Dharma Chakra, not the Ashoka Chakra, this is the Buddha Dharma Chakra being worshipped. Many, many stories from the Jatakas, etc., etc. So this is how the Toranas of Sanchi look exquisite, exquisite pieces of art, these are. And um, many postage stamps also have this. All right. Now, this is a place called Barhat in Madhya Pradesh, which originally had a Buddhist stupa, completely broke. And in the British times, many of the pieces were taken to the museum in Calcutta, Kolkata of today. So here is the Vedika or the compound wall of that stupa that is no more in Barhat. What is very interesting is these vertical pillars have round, round sculptures. Now let us look at what, are, what is there in these sculptures. So here is a lady lying down on a cot and three other ladies around her. One is holding a fly whisk, which means this lady must be of some importance. Yes, it's a very important lady. She is, she, this, what is shown here, uh, the lady shown here is Maya Devi, wife of King Shuddhodhana. Their son was to be Gautama Siddhartha, who was later hailed all over the world as Buddha. So there is a white elephant, there is an elephant shown over here. And because we already know the story, we will understand that this is a white elephant. Maya Devi had a dream that a white elephant entered her womb. And then uh, later she gave birth to Siddhartha. It was supposed to be a very, very good omen. And here, look, look at this. This is a wonderful small area. They have put in so many sculptures. So there is a tree here and there's a tree here. There's a monkey lying horizontal. He is catching hold of a branch of this tree. He's tied his tail. Very clearly, he's tied his tail to a branch of that tree. This is actually a river in between. This is a, a leader monkey uh, acting as a bridge for all his other monkeys to jump over him and go to the other side so that they could be safe from the army of a king who was hunting in that forest. It is said that all the monkeys jumped from this tree onto the back of that monkey and on the other side and escaped to safety. And a very bad monkey finally jumped up, jumped on the back of the brave leader monkey, broke his back and then went to the other side. And the dying leader monkey was picked up by the king and he gave a long uh, lecture and then the monkey died. The monkey gave the lecture and then he died. So this monkey, having done this very good deed and then having died, was Buddha in one of his previous births. So that is also uh, one of the Jataka tales that is given on the sculpture of the Barhat uh, Stupa. Now here, here, above the sculpture, just give me a second. Above the sculpture, you have an inscription that is also in the Brahmi script about which we spoke at length last time. Quickly, quickly, let us go to Maharashtra. We are jumping from place to place today. In Maharashtra, we are going to a place called Ajanta, which is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this is a horseshoe-shaped ravine. And the Buddhists, as early as the 2nd century BC or even earlier, chose Ajanta as a place where they could dwell 
far away from the crowds where they could meditate and slowly so this is how the river vagora is that has cut down into the rock for millions and millions of years and all these green green things that are protruding into the black area are the caves of ajanta they're approximately approximately 28 or 30 in number these are the caves now these have been cut before the time of missionary tools etc deep 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 into the rock for the buddhists over here to pray and for the buddhists over here to live in so let me quickly show you some diagrams again this is scanned from a book called art of ancient india by susan huntington i am showing you what are called the viharas there are two types of structures in ajanta they are called the viharas and the chaityas the viharas are the place where the buddhist monks lived and the chaityas were the places where they prayed so there are far more viharas than chaityas there are few chaityas many many viharas so the vihara is like all the black portion that you are seeing is actually the rock and the white portion that you see is where the architects have cut through the black black dots are the pillars okay so this is how deep into the hard rock they have been cut these are the chaityas the places of worship generally horseshoe shape the big black portion that you see inside is a stupa i will show that to you now just look at this i mean this is simply understanding however many times you see photographs of of the caves of ajanta however many times you may go to ajanta you will have to pause in wonderment how these people and they work from the second approximately second century bc down to the 5th century ad these caves were made in the time of the kings of the satavahana dynasty and many many more were made during the time of the kings of the vakataka dynasty great great architects great great sculptures hardly do we know their names they didn't bother they just left behind great works of architecture and sculpture so imagine this rock is all the architect and the sculptor would have seen and then they cut in 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 little by little all these pillars the four pillars that you see in the facade the outermost portion have not been made elsewhere and brought here no these are all part of the living rock and they are identical you can go measure they are absolutely identical no difference in pattern no difference in shape perfectly symmetrical so this is how the caves look and when you go into the chaityas everything everything needless to say everything is one piece of stone completely one piece of stone so i've already explained to you what a stupa is from sanchi uh, a relic of the buddha or one of the acharyas is kept and then a big hemispherical structure is built over it and then it is worshiped by buddhists here this is also a stupa no doubt but this is made of one piece of stone it's part of the living rock as i mentioned earlier so there is no possibility of keeping a relic inside it's just a stupa with the figure of the buddha and the buddhas used to go round and round it in pradakshina so there is place for going around it the place place for going around the pillars also so this is how a uh, chaitya looks in ajanta look at the top portion look at this why did they make all these lines over here you know they look like a ribs why why so many things there so you see this is basically to make it look like wood prior to these buddhist chaityas being made of stone as in the case of ajanta they were made of wood and uh, these architects and sculptors who were creating these caves of ajanta remembered that tradition when they were making of wood of timber and they incorporated that pattern of having wooden beams on top and they made it like this even if we don't understand what they were trying to do when you look up at a chaitya in ajanta it looks so beautiful so this is can you see the space where the buddhists could actually circumambulate they could go around now these the, all this is in ajanta oh this has this place has a wonderful in one of the caves there is um, a wonderful wonderful sculpture 
of Buddha in Parinirvana. We all know that Buddha was enlightened. When he sat under the Bodhi tree and meditated, he got enlightened and that's why he is called the Buddha, the enlightened one. But Parinirvana is when he shed his mortal body and attained complete uh, liberation, Nirvana. So this sculpture they have made, I'll go back to the previous slide here, very difficult to take a photograph of the entire sculpture of the Buddha because it is so long and the space around is very narrow. So again, I have, I have scanned this from Susan Huntington's book and uh, it was taken in three parts and stitched together. So this is seven meters long. Can you believe it? And look at the, the talent of the sculptor who made this. Look at the face of the Buddha. It's as though he's actually sleeping. So peaceful. And these are all his devotees. Um, many, many of the sculptures in Ajanta still have traces of paintings on them. We all know that this place is very, very famous. The paintings of Ajanta are world famous. They are made according to a technique called fresco. The fresco technique is when the, the artist used to paint when the surface was still wet. It's a huge, very difficult technique. And the artists of Ajanta actually mastered it. So this is <clears throat> Lokeshwara, one of the deities of, uh, of uh, Buddhism. Just give me a second. Show you some of the paintings. Very, very lifelike. They are from various Jatakas also. Look at Buddha over here. Look at the walls to the cushion um, which he is resting on. Even the design on the cushion you can still see today. Look at this lady. Look at the jewels she is wearing. Look at the garment she is wearing. There are duck motifs. This is uh, some kind of a print that she has on what she is wearing. Look at the jewels of this lady. So many details you can observe in the paintings of Ajanta. A lady looking at herself in the mirror and this uh, necklace that she is wearing must be pearls. They are shining even today. We are coming back to the Kailasanatha temple in Kanchipuram. We are going from topic to topic to topic. None of which is connected as far as this lecture is concerned. So we are coming to the Kailasanatha temple in Kanchipuram. Uh, <clears throat> many of you may have gone there. And many of you may not have. Now, this is the entrance to the uh, temple. Now, generally, an entrance to a South Indian temple, especially a temple in Tamil Nadu, will have a gopuram. When people pass through this doorway, they seldom realize that this is a gopuram. Very rarely. Because it is so insignificant. When, I'm um, sorry, when generally when you see a gopuram, this is the Tanjavur Bhiridishwara temple, we think of this as a gopuram. So I'm get, going back to the one in the Kailasanatha temple. It is from this very insignificant, inconspicuous structure early in, in the Pallava times. This is 8th century Pallava. Gopurams were there earlier also, we know. There is one in the short temple in Mahabalipuram, in Mahabalipuram. So from these very, very small structures, over the next few centuries, it goes to become like this. This is in the Bhradishwara temple in Tanjavur. This also. And uh, these are the two Gopurams. They are not too tall, but they look like Gopurams. And then uh, slowly, 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 I'm not giving you all the details. Slowly they become like this. This is in the Vijayanagara times. And then the Nayak times, who were the successors of Vijayanagara. This is in the Madurai Meenakshi temple. Look at the number of sculptures that are done, that southern Gopuram in the Meenakshi temple, Madurai. So, the Gopurams are becoming bigger and bigger, more and more beautifully decorated. And it's a huge evolution of the Gopura concept. Kailasanatha temple also has some very beautiful sculptures. Now, this very clearly, all of you can identify, is Narsimha fighting with the demon Kiranya Kashipu. All right. This is a fighting scene. Now, this also is a scene where two people are fighting. That one you could clearly recognize because Narsimha, face of a lion, and the person he is fighting with had to be Hiranyakashipu. Now, who are these two people? Are they gods? Are they men? What are they fighting over? So, this is very interesting. 
This is from a story in the Mahabharata where Arjuna goes all the way to the Himalayas to perform penance in order to get from God Shiva a very important weapon called the Pashupata Astra. Shiva, as many of you know, has the name Pashupati. So the Astra or the weapon that he had is the Pashupata, Pashupati, Pashupata Astra. And Arjuna wanted that weapon, that Astra, uh, to fight with the Kauravas in the battle of Kurukshetra. So he performs penance and penance, he performs, he becomes thin, he becomes emaciated. And finally, Shiva decides to give him that weapon. So Shiva comes all the way to the place in the Himalayas where Arjuna is performing penance and decides to test him. So what Shiva does is he sends a wild boar towards Arjuna. And as Arjuna is going to shoot an arrow at the boar, Shiva shoots an arrow at the same time. And both of them start fighting as to who killed the boar first. Now, if you look at this sculpture, if you want to know who it is, you will have to look at all the details. Give me a second. Let me zoom. So here, behind, can you see, I don't have the full photograph because this is in a niche and very difficult to take a full photograph. Do you see the hind part of a boar? So these sculptors wanted to depict Shiva. This is God Shiva who comes as a hunter. This is Arjuna shown with a crown to show that he is a Pandava prince. Just to show that. And the wild boar over here to show that this is the fight between Shiva and Arjuna. Of course, Shiva won that fight and uh, Arjuna realized it was Shiva and then the Pashupata Astra was handed over to him. <coughs> That's the story. Now, it's given a, it's, it's portrayed in sculpture in this temple. Now, why was, why did this artist, this sculptor decide to put in a sculpture of this little known story in the Mahabharata? I mean, why, there are so many stories in the Mahabharata. Why did he decide to put in this fight of Arjuna and Shiva? For what reason? Reason is because there was a very, very great scholar called Bharavi who lived in the Pallava times. And Bharavi wrote a wonderful work called the Kiratarjuniyam. Kirata means hunter. Kiratarjuniyam is the story of the Kirata, that is Shiva as a hunter and Arjuna. Bharavi took that little story from the Mahabharata and made it into a beautiful work in Sanskrit. And therefore, in the Pallava times, Bharavi's work was so famous that it was the, the concept of it was made into a culture. So that is the link over there. Just going to show you, before I wind up with another five minutes, just going to show you some of the beautiful, beautiful bronze images that are there in Tamil Nadu. Now, um, these are generally made either of copper and when they are made of copper, the inscriptions call them Cheppu Thirimeni. Cheppu is copper and Tamil. Meni is body. Thirimeni is sacred body. So the sacred body of God made of copper is Cheppu Thirimeni. Some of these images were made of pure gold. Inscriptions tell us that. Some of these inscriptions, uh, some of these, these sculptures, sorry, were made of gold. Some of these sculptures were made of silver. Some of these sculptures were made of pancha loha, five metals. Gold, silver, copper, tin, and lead. Panchaloha is very famous. So, this is um, bronze of Shiva marrying Parvati. And this is called Kalyana Sundara. Uh, Vishnu is over here because we know that Parvati is his sister and he gave her in marriage to Shiva. And this is Parvati's attendant. Now, these sculptures, um, bronze sculptures, in India, starting from the Indus Saraswati times, were made of a technique called lost wax. So any, any metal image that you see like this was originally, remember, made of wax. And then there was, I'm putting this again in a nutshell, a coating of a clay soil was put on the wax and it was heated. So when heated, wax melts. So the wax used to melt and come out of certain tubes or holes made in the clay. All the wax would come out. So what you would have is the empty clay mold. Since all the wax has melted and come out, it's called the lost wax process. 
and into that empty clay mold after all the wax has come out the molten metal whichever metal it is that you wanted was poured in and once that metal molten metal became solidified the clay mold was removed and then you would have images like this the finer work was done and after it was taken to a temple the very very fine final stage was see even when it was completed the eyes would be there but the pupil of the eye would not be there the final stage after it was taken into a temple is called the opening of the eye ceremony netron milanam netra is eye unmilanam is to open netron milanam chakshu unmilanam so these are the terms that are used nayanon milanam so the opening of the eye ceremony meaning the pupils were actually made there and then the god opens his eyes very very important ceremony so these are some of the outstanding bronze images you see the front this is shiva um, as though leaning on the bull and parvati next to him look look at look at shiva's head from the back look at that pose so beautiful parvati over here many 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 sculptures bronze uh, images but when we see a bronze images let us understand the difficulty into which the sculptor made while doing it final few slides we think hindu temples are confined to india no way so the only country that has a temple as the emblem on its flag is cambodia so cambodia is flag has this temple angkor wat which was a vishnu temple later became a hindu uh, later became a buddhist temple and this is the image of vishnu that was in the main sanctum and that is now uh, kept at the entrance as you enter the temple it's an eight armed vishnu ashta bhuja vishnu is over here in angkor wat but we also learn of many many ashta bhuja vishnus in india it's not as though it was only outside india it was in india also so our ancient culture was not only in india it went to many 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 countries of southeast asia it went to indonesia vietnam laos cambodia thailand name it buddhism hinduism all of it much much of temple architecture sculpture the script the language much of it went from india to very many countries much do we have to be proud of in india our ancients have left behind so much for us by way of medicine by way of astronomy by way of temple architecture sculpture literature in various languages various scripts something that we need to be inordinately proud of and stand uh, with our heads held high and to all the youngsters in this audience um, this is a message that i have given many times to to many youngsters and i'm giving it to you now please listen go on to become whatever you want doctors and engineers lawyers whatever whatever but remember that you come from a great heritage you have a great culture in this country take it forward be proud of it and when you grow up hand it to the next generation that's my request to you thank you all very much the session is now open for questions uh, do ask um akka we have received a question from youtube yeah uh, ma'am you mentioned ayurveda isn't siddha the traditional school of medicine for tamil nadu siddha ayurveda that's why i said traditional schools of medicine i mentioned ayurveda but repeatedly i said traditional medicine siddha also definitely definitely um akka the temples in tamil nadu has the kalasham with grains does other temples in other um, other states have the kalasham with grains um should have because the kalasham has grains which are there to absorb the lightning generally a temples a temple in ancient and medieval times it's no more the norm in modern times no more is it followed we have buildings much higher than a temple gopuram or a temple vimanam the tallest point would have a kalasham filled with grains that would 
absorb the electricity from the lightning and earth it so that the rest of the village or the town or the city was not affected so it's a good question to temples of north india also have kalashams should be it should be there okay um is another question uh, you have repeated many times but please can you clarify the ashok chakra and buddha chakra okay so we generally call it the ashoka chakra i don't know how and why this started it is actually the buddha dharma chakra the chakra that you see on many of the buddhist monuments including the emblem of india is the dharma chakra which represents the philosophy or the teaching of the buddha it is there in very many buddhist monuments and sometimes you see that chakra flanked by two deer flanked by deer because it was in the deer park in sarnath near kashi in today's uttar pradesh that in madhya today's madhya pradesh sorry that buddha preached his first lecture first sermon and therefore the buddha dharma chakra with two deer are uh, are seen in many of the buddhist monuments i clarify it's the buddha dharma chakra okay um another question is there any temple in kanchi with laughing buddha statue not to the best of my knowledge no okay um during the 13 to 16th centuries what was taught in colleges and schools in india 13th to 16th uh, centuries in india yes so yeah uh, definitely we we had uh, institutions teaching the veda and so very uh, grammar logic uh, so many things there is one thing that i forgot to say and this this um, question reminds me we have a chola period chola era inscription that tells us that uh, veterinary science was also taught in some of these schools so you know they had so many animals and they needed to be taken care of so veterinary science was also an important subject in ancient india so so many subjects much of you know all the ayurveda and the um, astronomy and the scriptures these are the subjects that would have been taught uh in many of these institutions some of which we know about some of which we don't know about for want of sources okay um there's another question ma'am i've heard about a temple whose shadow never falls on the ground which temple is it okay i'm glad you asked the question so the temple whose shadow is said never to fall on the ground is the one that i'm showing you in this picture the famous brihadeshwara temple in tanjavur which is a unesco world heritage uh, structure today now just tell me one thing the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and even if i keep a small water bottle on the ground the shadow is bound to fall how can the shadow of something going up 60.96 meters not feet 60.96 meters not have its shadow on the ground the shadow does fall and unfortunately in many books in many websites in many articles people have said that the shadow does not fall the shadow falls you can go there and you can see it clearly the shadow of the of this vimana that is the main structure above the place of worship the shadow does fall another mistake that people generally make is that the tall um, that structure right on top over there this one the shikara is that is made of one piece of stone many people believe that and they believe that a very very long ramp for many kilometers was erected and that one stone was pushed up by elephants etc etc that is totally wrong it is not one piece of stone it's not one piece of stone stone weighing some 70 80 tons as people have said it is many pieces of stone taken up there put together and it looks like one piece of stone when you see it from ground level that's all it is not one piece of stone i wish to clarify that uh, okay akka can you tell the name of any famous sculptor who carved the temples in tamil nadu um see 
there are some inscriptions that gives give us the name of a few sculptors uh, even the architect of this temple was rajarajan perun tarchan that was the name off hand i am not able to think of the name of a particular sculptor in tamil nadu but stray inscriptions very few inscriptions give us that even the names of very few architects are available to us even throughout india in the hoysala temples in karnataka the names of architects and sculptors are given mallanna etc etc here in tamil nadu the rest of india itself very very few names are there very few um in kanchipuram are there are there remains of the libraries or learning institutions that were there unfortunately no, no we don't have anything like i said uh, kanchipuram would never have had imposing structures like were there in the nalanda university they and best would have studied inside the temples inside the buddhist uh, centers of uh, worship and in the jaina centers so if there had been structures like they were in nalanda we would have easily seen them but no nothing like that however definitely definitely kanchipuram was an immensely important center of learning no doubt about it. um what is the name of the chinese buddhist who came to india here in india we pronounce his name as huin sang but that's not the correct pronunciation it's a chinese pronunciation that i am unable to get okay h i e u n t s a n g 7th century chinese buddhist okay um in the vedic period it was the nature which was worshiped as gods the trees um are so can be connected to temples in the sense of the sacred trees being a part of a temple worship uh, maybe um gayatri ayer could you please uh, unmute yeah yourself? i meant yes i meant the same i meant the trees which were shown as the vriksham uh, stala vriksham are they the connection is uh, because the vedic period the nature was the one which was worshiped as god so is that is that the connection that was kept by these temples it's a good question the practice of worshiping nature has been there in the hindu tradition starting from the vedic times that is absolutely there so when a tree is considered sacred it is considered so mainly because of its connection with one deity or the other or just to give you an example the bilbam is offered for to shiva and tulsi is offered to vishnu etc 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 and it to that the medicinal properties of these trees and plants were recognized by the ancients the the importance of nature was recognized by for the wind and the sun and the moon yes nature worship was there it does continue in present day hinduism till today okay um we have received a question which is written in tamil um could uh, could you please unmute yourself the one who asked in tamil mm. okay we will just proceed um was there an ashokan stupa in kanchipuram don't mind i can read the question i can read tamil na padichu sollatuma yes please very this is from youtube is it no no this is from zoom, is from zoom. Oh, okay okay please read ஆஹ் அது இட் கோஸ் லைக் திஸ் ரிட்டன் பை பூ ரவிக்குமார் எனக்கு ஆங்கிலத்தில் கேள்வி கேட்க தெரியாது ஆகவே தமிழில் கேட்கிறேன் கோவில்களை பொறுத்தவரை இந்தியாவில் புத்த அடையாளங்கள் தான் மூத்தவையா ஐ திங்க் இட் மீன்ஸ் ஆர் தே மோர் நான் தமிழ்லயே பதில் சொல்றேன் இப்போ இப்படி சொல்றேன் நான் இப்போ நம்ம வந்து இந்தியால பாக்குற ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ஸ்லயே புத்திஸ்ட் ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ஸ் பெரும்பாலும் ரொம்ப பழமையானவை அஜந்தாலையும் மற்ற இடத்துலையும் ஆனால் என்னோட கருத்து என்னன்னா மரத்திலையோ இல்ல செங்கல்லையோ அதுக்கு முன்னாடி புத்திஸ்ட் ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ஸும் இருந்திருக்கலாம் ஹிந்து ஸ்ட்ரக்சர்ஸும் இருந்திருக்கலாம் புத்திஸ் வந்து ஸ்டோன்ல கன்வெர்ட் பண்ணாங்க த ஏர்லியஸ்ட் குக கோவில் த ஏர்லியஸ்ட் கேப் டெம்பிள்ஸ் இன் இந்தியா அமங் த ஏர்லியஸ்ட் ஐ கரெக்ட் மை செல்ஃப் அமங் த ஏர்லியஸ்ட் கேப் டெம்பிள்ஸ் ஆஃப் இந்தியா ஆர் தோஸ் பிலாங்கிங் டு த புத்திஸ் நோ டவுட் அவங்க வந்து 
கட்டடக்கலைய மரத்தால பண்ணிக்கிற ஒரு காலம் ஒண்ணு உண்டு அப்புறம் வந்து அத கல்லால பண்ணாங்க அதுக்கப்புறம் தான் கல்லால பண்ண ஹிந்து டெம்பிள்ஸ் நம்ம பாக்குறோம் ஆனால் செங்கலாலையோ மரத்தாலையோ பண்ண ஹிந்து டெம்பிள்ஸ் அதுக்கு முன்னாடி இருந்திருக்குமா இருந்திருக்காதான்னு நம்மளுக்கு இப்போ தெரியல நான் அப்படி சொல்றேன் ஓகே சசி I think we can have people to unmute themselves and ask questions. Okay, go ahead. Please unmute yourself. Uh, can you please repeat that question and answer in English, please? In English. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. So his question in Tamil was, are Buddhist temples the earliest we see in India today? So my answer is yes. um so there is the the caves of ajanta are among the earliest stone structures in india among the earliest so they are in stone prior to that as i mentioned in my lecture itself they would have been there in wood wood the structures i repeat today some of the earliest structures in stone are buddhist so they converted from the medium of wood into the medium of stone the stone structures of the hindus that we see today are after the buddhist stone structures but my uh, my perspective the perspective from which i think is would there also have been structures made of wood or brick alongside the wooden structures brick structures of the buddhists at one point of time the buddhists converted to stone earlier and the hindus converted to stone after the buddhists from the available evidence today is that clear thank you yeah um ma'am you said that arjuna fought with shiva when they fought which animal came to the fighting place boar b o a r the varaha in sanskrit okay um which is the tallest temple in india very difficult question so are we looking at the vimanam that is the structure above the main place of worship or are we looking at the gopuram which is the entrance way are we looking at india on the whole or are we looking only at the south Can you clarify? We are looking at uh, we are looking at India, ma'am, and okay. the Gopuram masking. The Gopuram. Gopuram. If it's Gopuram, then it's definitely South India. And uh, if you are not look, yeah, we have two modern ones. One is in Karnataka. The I think it's the Marudishwar Temple, if I'm not mistaken, the Shiva Temple. The other one is the famous uh, outermost southern Gopuram of the. temple on the island of srirangam the ranganatha swami temple but let's remember both these gopurams the one in karnataka is very modern and the sri the base of the srirangam gopuram belongs to the 17th century and the superstructure the tall part belongs to the 20th century so these are okay. in south india okay um akka where can we find the vedic books what vedic books the vedas um can can the person who asked this question unmute yeah, and the, yeah i mean the vedas like uh, as you told that in the three libraries uh, which vedas were found like where okay, are they the, now say the three libraries in in uh, nalanda university were unfortunately burnt down in the 13th century the whole university was burnt down by an invader called bhakti ar kilji the, all the manuscripts were burned the all the buildings were burned the entire university almost came to an end because the invader set fire to it so this library was mainly a buddhist library with buddhist manuscripts it has may have been there perhaps but it was mainly a buddhist library but it was burnt down by bhakti ar kilji side end to a glorious after that day it was slightly revived but what was gone was gone 
Akka, according to Vimanam uh, side, which would be the tallest temple? Vimanam, the one I'm showing you on the screen, the Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur in South India, and the Jagannath temple in Puri in North India. Okay. In Orissa. Okay. Um, I know for, the wood used for making the idols, um, was it, um, I mean, traditionally stipulated that only certain type of trees can be used for making those idols? And was there a difference between the way, say, Buddhist viewed it and Hinduism viewed it? I would not know how exactly Buddhism viewed it. But as far as Hinduism is concerned, I can tell you that according to the, the traditional text, the Agama Shastras, Deities were allowed to be made of wood, of stucco, that is lime plaster. Uh, uh, actually, a painting could also be worshipped. It could be stone as well. And definitely, uh, only certain types of wood could be used. For example, if you go to the Puri Jagannath temple, the most famous temple where the main deities are of wood. There are other temples also. When you think of wooden deities, it's Puri Jagannath. Yes, it is stipulated that only a certain type of tree can be used for making that wood. And they go deep into the forest and they get and they get that uh, wood. Yes, it is stipulated. And I can add to that, when temple chariots or the ratas are made, it is very clearly stated that mainly two types of wood should be used, among which one is teak, teak. And the other one is ilupai, ilupa maram which is Madhuka in, uh, in, the, in the technical uh, uh, term. So the Ilupa and Teak are very resistant to uh, termites. And that's why both of them have been recommended for making temple chariots. Thank you. Okay. Akka, there's another question. Uh, for some of the Stala Vrikshans, it is claimed that some of them are thousand years old. Are these claims true? Um, it's very difficult for a tree to live on for a thousand years. Generally, what would happen, I'm not taking away from the religious element, please uh, forgive me. Generally, what would happen is a branch of the tree or a graft of the tree would be taken and replanted in the same place. It is, technically speaking, that very tree itself. For example, a branch of the Bodhi tree was taken to Sri Lanka and it is worshipped over there. Similar. Uh, Ma'am? Yes? Uh, um, uh, was the Brihadishwara temple in any manner like uh, worn away or destroyed or something? Yes. Uh, the Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur was um, destroyed partially. It was damaged uh, in uh, several invasions that at least one particular invasion in 1310, 1311, uh, during the time of Malik of Food, in the reign of Alauddin Kilji from uh, North India. Yeah. Ma'am, I heard that uh, the Nalanda University took quite a lot of time to get destroyed uh, till the state in which it is now. So out of which material was it made? No, the, the structures of Nalanda University were made using brick, mainly stone also. Uh, no. But yes. Uh, why did he? Why did he uh, destroy? Wanted to destroy the Alanda University. It was an invasion. It was an invasion, and the invader destroyed a center of learning. It is so sad. Precious manuscripts containing a lot of important information in 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 so many subjects was destroyed. Unfortunately. No, precious, he, precious manuscripts. He also ruled over India, right? The Bhakti Atiji. Bhakti Atiji did not rule over India. No. That, it's not that Kinji dynasty. That's allowed in Kinji. Okay. Thank you. Akka, another yes? question. Yeah. The world started from early humans who found the mythology of gods and who got the idea to believe it and make temples. Uh, so I think the question is, who got this idea to believe and make temples, believe the mythologies and uh, make temples? It's, uh, it's too profound a question for me to answer. I don't know about that. It's just that temples are uh, centers of learning, huge, huge, I mean, centers of worship. Uh, they've been there for a very long time. I, I really don't get this question, so I'm not able to answer it. Okay. 
um another question was there any temple inscription across india depicting about music raga or songs um across india i wouldn't be able to tell you but uh, definitely in uh, tamil nadu there's a place called pudumiya malai in pudukottai district and there you have a 7th century inscription that give you a string of swaras uh, they call it a musical inscription i prefer to call it an inscription on music and those swaras were meant to be practiced um, on a musical instrument called the paribadini uh, a similar inscription is also there in a place called tirumayam again in pudukottai district around the 7th century uh, these inscriptions are written in the grantha script uh, in other parts of india i am really not too sure okay um another question from youtube from your previous week's talk my 12 year old asks this question was it other kings who broke ashoka's pillar in india we do not we don't i don't know the answer i, I mentioned that last time. okay um, was there an ashoka stupa in kanchipuram too was there an ashoka stupa in kanchipuram twin sang uh, mentions that kanchipuram had uh, you know more than 10000 buddhist monks and him set a stupa having been there what happened to that stupa we don't know who destroyed it was it destroyed was it really there i'm not in a position to say i'm preempting question um another question from youtube in which chola inscription mention, mentions about veterinary uh, can you be more specific it's a 13th century inscription of hand i don't remember from which temple it is but if this person could send me an email uh, i i i have the information with me uh, it's from a little known temple uh, somewhere i think near kumbakonam if i'm not mistaken very very chola area chornadu so i can answer i can give you my email id now any one of you who wants to ask questions at a later points of time can also write to me if you are interested it's dr b for dog r for rat c h i t h r a at gmail.com so that we can take it from that you 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 can you can write to me at this address oh thank you welcome all right are we done i had a question yes please um okay so you mentioned uh, like you sort of briefly passed through um, a dynasty called the kadamba dynasty yes um do you have any more information about the dynasty yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this was in um, uh, Karnataka, and uh, the person who started it was Mayur Sharman. As I told you, came to the Pallava country to study the Vedas and had some kind of a quarrel with the Pallava soldiers. Went back with the aim of creating his own uh, his own uh, kingdom. And Mayur Sharman, the Sharma suffix indicates that he was a Brahmin, but he took to the profession of a Kshatriya. and if we look at the inscription that i showed you uh, the names of his successors are given and all of them have the suffix varman so sharman is the suffix of a brahmin varman is the suffix of a kshatriya so slowly over time mayur sharman successors had uh, the varman name and they became uh, kshatriyas they ruled over a fairly big uh, place uh the emblem uh, their their royal crest was the lion so there are many temples of the kadamba times but uh, unfortunately many of them have been uh, added to in later times so yeah this okay this so uh, the the inscription that you were talking about the one from the next slide right? um was that from the kadamba time or was it written after the kadamba it were good question it was from the kadamba time it was by one of the successors of mayur sharma very much i think the fourth or fifth in descent from mayur sharma who actually had that inscription incise it's in a place called talagunda in shimoga district karnataka um okay, okay. thank you can i exit from the session yes yes sure sure 
Somebody else had a question. question. Yes, we'll take another two or three max, uh, and then we'll end the session. Akka, I have a doubt. Yes, please. Um, like um, Akka, where do you read about these Vedic books? Like, can you recommend us some books, or um, where can we read it more about it? Like, but what are these Vedic books that you are talking about? I don't understand. Um, Vedic... Yeah, yeah, like the um, Vedas themselves. You're saying. Yes. Okay. So translations of some parts of the Vedas are available. Uh, there are some. There are some stotras. There are some verses uh, that are in praise of uh, deities. Various other uh, aspects of everyday life are also given in the Vedas. Translations are available. and if you look up uh, history books you can find a chapter on the vedic times you can also read that and understand what they did in those in those eras okay okay thank you but uh, akka where can we find this uh, translations you can search on the net they it will give you the names of books again off hand i can't tell you the name of any one particular book there are there are translations of portions of the vedas that are available Okay, Akka, thank you. Amma, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, last. Ma'am, Akka. Mm-hmm. Is there any other god related to the classical dance other than Nataraja? Is there any other god? Akka, is there any other god related to uh, classical dance other than Nataraja? See, mainly we have, as far as culture is concerned, I can tell you, it is Shiva dancing as, as Shiva's aspect as Nataraja. you also have ganesha dancing you have parvati dancing in in many temples as sculptures is that your question or i don't exactly follow what you are saying but we call that uh, nataraja as a dancing shiva no yes correct so there are any other gods dancing yeah ganesha nrtya ganapati very famous krishna dancing famous mm, you even in in a in a in a temple in varangal uh, the thousand pillar temple in varangal you have narsuma dancing you can see surya dancing many deities dance saraswati dancing in the hoysala temples there is there is deities uh, in krishna. the culture yes krishna. Krishna, krishna yes krishna kalinga nartana krishna is there uh, the dancing god temples are uh, situated in chennai dancing god temples no where you have temples where there are sculptures of gods dancing mainly it's nataraja Akka, from the previous session, we had received a question about how to pursue archaeology as a career option. Ah, so um, the first thing is, if you want to pursue archaeology as a profession, intense amount of interest should be there. Otherwise, it won't see you through. You have to be very passionate about what you are studying. You really must love the subject. uh and then many years of toil so so you know after four years of engineering you become an engineer and you get a job here no it's not like that so it's three years of ba two years of ma and then many 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 years of research before you get your phd and where are the job opportunities very few can join the archaeological survey of india not everybody can join and lecturers you can become a teacher there are that many posts only um i'm a freelancer you can become a freelancer that like me but it's a lot of hard work for many many years before you can give a lecture like this to lovely young students uh the job opportunities are pretty limited for archaeologists i have to tell you that it's a great subject it's an interesting subject we do need more youngsters in this field in india there is an option in the sense you can go on to study some other subject you can do that as well and then take this up as a passion side by side you can study it uh, or after you finish studying and and get a job you can study this also very very possible you can uh, develop a keen interest in any one branch like epigraphy that's the study of inscriptions or numismatics that's the study of coins or temple architecture field archaeology whatever there are many branches in archaeology 
you can you can develop an interest in that and you can have it as a side profession i know of many people who have had other professions i mean in professionals in other spheres and taken to the study of coins or inscriptions etc for sheer passion and they have done so well that their books are being consulted by uh, professional archaeologists that is an option that is a viable option okay akka yeah akka do you think that gods were aliens i i really don't know enough to answer that question i really all i know is like temple um, architecture and inscriptions etc that's all i know man did the brihadeshwara temple really surface six earthquake with a damage the brihadeshwara temple is slightly damaged yes see this part is damaged no doubt uh, akka another question yeah did the uh, brihadeshwara temple really survive six earthquakes without being damaged i don't know about six earthquakes and nor is tamil nadu a place that is very very prone to earthquakes if at all they are very mild but then it's 1000 plus years since this temple was built and we don't know how many ground tremors there have been since then uh so you see it's not only the brihadeshwara temple there are temples and temples across india which have sur- survived quakes and the reason for it is the method of building so it's in tamil nadu is pretty safe uh, is a pretty safe zone as far as earthquakes are concerned compared to other parts of india so why just the brihadeshwara temple we can look at every other temple in india in the same perspective Yeah. So maybe just have another one question and wind up, please. Namaste, Akka. Namaste. Hi, I'm Karun, Akka. I have a question about the Kailash Nath Temple, Akka. Yeah, yeah, sure. Akka, uh, it's also a monolithic temple, Akka. So was it built by the Pallavas or any influence about them? Okay, so the Kailash Temple that you are referring to is the one in Elora, right? Yes, Akka. Uh, so that's a monolith, meaning the whole thing is made of one piece of stone. and that one uh, was we can't use the word built because building is putting one stone upon the other that one was carved it was excavated out of a hill side and that belongs to a dynasty called the rashtrakutas who ruled in that area ka yes sir ka but uh, would there be any influence of the pallava sculptures or Li- likely likely we can't uh, exclude that because you see Uh, the architecture and sculpture in one part of india had influenced other parts also there is no doubt about it for example the sculptures of the sculptures and architecture of the chalukyas definitely impacted the pallavas to a certain extent maybe vice versa the pandyas and the pallavas pallavas and the pandyas so much interlinking interconnections are there so i can't tell you that it was in there very likely very likely that it was there okay thank you thank you ma'am can i squeeze in one last question sure all right go ahead yeah you had mentioned uh, that uh, some temple where you, that there was a grantha inscription right so when it comes to scripts i mean we have the grantham we have the uh, devanagari and i think tamil script is probably called sangam script if i'm not mistaken is is grantham like the parent script of both and is that um, how often do we actually see that in uh, temple inscriptions okay so we have the grantha script uh, we have tamil as such we don't call it sangam tamil so in the previous session i had mentioned that this script called brahmi which we see in the inscriptions the edicts of ashoka also in tamil nadu is one of the is is the mother script of india from brahmi came tamil from brahmi came uh, the devanagari script over the evolution of many centuries grantha is separate that is a script that we see mainly in tamil nadu from the 7th century ad onwards it is popularly called pallava grantha because the pallavas used it extensively grantha was mainly used for writing sanskrita the pandyas also used grantha simultaneously with the pallavas later chola vijayanagara all of them used the grantha script 
you can even see it in far away cambodia but grantha i repeat is mainly for writing sanskritam only thank you okay welcome um could uh, could i ask other participants to please email akka uh, their questions yes please i will definitely answer you all right so uh, thanks so much for your time ma'am not at all with great pleasure thank you all for joining this uh, session and uh, once again a huge huge thanks to tatwa loka and to shreya and to rama for all their uh, technical support to eat yes please ma'am i have a question ma'am okay i'll take your question that will be the final one tell me do we have any buddha temple in india yes the caves of ajanta that i showed you you mean yes, temples that uh? can't hear you tell me you said something yeah there are many buddhist temples in india very many buddhist temples sure there are ancient ones modern ones also they are there okay, okay. right so so thank you all very very much and have a wonderful day thank you ma'am welcome